So Kate Kittredge, would you say that that would be an example of getting more streamlined? Because certainly a lot of critics responded to seeing seeing that film as being a more formally streamlined film than streamlined as in less ordinary. Of fame. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that was just a um, that wasn't formally interesting in any way. <laughs> I think that to be to be honest, the very fact that it's a film targeting a specifically younger audience, but is still set so so far in the past, to me it was interesting because I was trying to imagine what it would be like to be in the target audience in this contemporary society and having to like watching something that was set so far. I know like it seems like the opposite of what the 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 people who have the property would want almost but they wouldn't want to make it contemporary yeah, and hip yeah, and yeah. like and let's let's put in some internet stuff yeah, or something yeah exactly. no I know no um, it's 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 this giant um, uh, machine in America called American Girl yeah. and that's it has almost nobody knows it here or nobody it's like the brand recognition in Canada is like twenty percent yeah. and it's eighty percent in the U S <laughs> so it's it's a whole thing so. I get a script from someone I really like and trust who used to be at Merrimax and they say, do you want to do this um, screenplay? It's a, it's a kid's movie. And, um, and I said, uh, American Girl, because I didn't know American Girl because I had kids in the zone. Yeah. Um, and uh, I said, hmm, I don't know, it's like a Sal and Dolls? You know, like what is this? She said, just read the script, have a look. And I read the script, and it was okay, and I kind of worked on a rewrite of it. And then they said, you have to decide by tomorrow, we've got Abigail Breslin, and we're going to shoot, you know, in, um, you know, a, a couple of months, and it's got, like it's a go, go, go. So I thought, ah, it's about a girl, lead girl, very, very rare. Yeah. Um, uh, who wants to write, more rare who's writing for social justice, more rare, at a time when America is um, kind of embraced as this, uh, sort of uh, the idea of a social net, of a, of a safety net. Um, and I just had this feeling like that with America, especially North America, the Western world was on the brink of disaster. That there were just articles just starting to come out about foreclosures and it just, I thought, there's. There's a whole, you know, generation of children who think that they deserve this, the level of wealth they've lived with, and they should know it's not a shame to lo to not have a lot of money. Um, that there's no shame in a reversal of fortune, and it's not your fault, and it's not your dad's fault if he loses his job, and it's not your. And it just seemed like writing for social good, and then scapegoatism happens whenever there's an economic downturn. So I just it seemed like good good um, values that uh, um, I liked and when do you get you know a kid of uh, that little girl's acting ability um, to lead a thing and I could be popular with my kids and my, <laughs> you know my kids were in it and I can visit the set and I'd been looking for one family film to really honor them you know like really do something that they were proud of and proud to know the person who did and then the actors come rushing all the and all they all have kids yeah Joan Cusack Stanley Tucci you know um, Chris O'Donnell Julie Ormond they all have kids they all Wally Sean didn't yeah I said Wally do you have do you, do you have kids because he was talking really sweetly to my daughter and he and he said no I've never been that strong in that department <laughs> <laughs> it's very very we actually stayed friends he's a very sweet funny guy um, HBO was involved in, in the production of that. Well, this was supposed to be HBO's um, entree into the world of features. Yeah, yeah. And they wanted to do a kids, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a feature film. So this was their big, but the two Han shows didn't get along that well, um, and so it kind of fell apart. Well, it's you know complicated the way these things always are. But the the company, the pic picture house that released it, fell apart. Where does something like this? fall in relation to say something like Happy Days where it's also kind of one-off but it's not seen as like a feature like it, it's somewhat it's rooted in something like in the case of Kit Kittredge it's the, the HBO it's the the property that it's representing and in an equally but opposite way you're representing the property of Samuel Beckett yeah well Samuel Beckett is more pure et dure right yeah. I mean it's, it's like it's that's this rare opportunity to yeah. engage with a mind of that 
at that level um, and uh, not have to pander to audiences, not have to make anybody pretty, not have to, you know, think about anything other than what was in this man's mind and what is it now? What? How can I do honor? How yeah. can I honor this? And you know, the big decision in that was where to shoot it, because Happy Days is about, as you know, a woman who's um, up to sand, up to her waist in sand, in the first act, and then up to her neck in sand, the second act, <laughs> and, it's like, and that is usually done on stage. And I thought, okay, but we're filming now. He wasn't thinking someone's on stage. He was thinking someone's in a wasteland. Where is a wasteland? I could go to the desert. And I thought, oh no, continuity with the sand. Nightmare, <laughs> nightmare. So I thought, volcano. Like, no life. Just volcanic. So so we went to the top of the uh, volcano in Tenerife. And there was, a, you know, I saved it. I love saving juicy things. Um, and then, you know, you just see you sort of medium claws and, 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 and then you cut wide and there's no life as far as you can see and you're on top of this mountain. Um, yeah, that, no, that was just that, again, I am only attracted by content. Yeah. Scale doesn't matter. TV, film, internet, YouTube doesn't matter. It's, is, is the point, is the, is there something I haven't done that. Maybe I didn't even know I wanted to do, but that I attracted to doing now. Um, is it? Is there? Uh, and are they people I want to have dinner with? Yeah. You know, because that's. I've made that mistake a couple of times, but um, yeah, that's that's really how I decide. It's because in the end, all that the people don't know what country or they don't care. It's the thing. Yeah. Is that thing going to speak the kind of words or the kind of feelings that I want to speak in the end. How about how that's distributed? Because it's it exists now, especially in like a uh, adaptations of Samuel Beckett, and it's kind of like Montreal Vupau, which is like also where your work is deliberately sitting aside the work of others, beside the work of others. How, how does that feel after you've created it to know that it's going to kind of be viewed in that context? Yeah, people want to make a competition out of uh, yeah. any, any kind of compilation always. That's just part of life. That the competitions create a, they're a story outside of your yeah. story. Um, I try not to pay attention to that, you know, because it's not, I mean, even award shows, these are, those are kind of artificial competitions that get some excitement around the work, but the work is the thing in the end. People don't remember who won what award, or you can put it on your CV, but it's not like, who cares? <laughs> it's just, you know, the thing itself. When you're 80, when you're whatever, you know, you're almost dead, the thing itself is the thing that matters, not that statue or that you got a, that someone said, oh, Rosamund's part of the compilation was better. I, you know, you, that. <laughs> I was thinking more optimistically. I was thinking like, because the subject matter or the source is the same, your voice comes out more because each part that you watch, you're that oh. much more aware of this is the, the person that's doing Oh, I doing see. It. Oh, interesting. Um, well, um, the, it was presented to us as, you can't fuck with this. Right? <laughs> because it, back in, he sued, he sued people, yeah. right, for, for, for altering his work, for making, mm -hmm. he had the, the, a theater troupe in Amsterdam, I think, a bunch of women did, did uh, Waiting for Godard in, in with all women, and he sued them. And like it was <laughs> hilarious, um, but anyway. So that was the uh, mission statement: do not, do not um, affect this. But I, within that, I still. So the big decision I, within that, I so I, all, everything was about staying out of the way. Get out of the way. This yeah. material is brilliant. Get is. out of the way. You know. Um, so I tried to edit as little as possible. I tried to move the camera as little as possible. My, I, what I discovered just technically was this wild thing where if you don't cut much when you do, it's like an explosion in the room. It suddenly feels really... Yeah. So I would really very carefully pick where the cuts would be because I knew that that was going to be a giant jolt. Um, I didn't... But then, I, you know, that, that was my choice at the time. And then Anthony Minghella's, have you seen his? Um, He's all over it. Yeah. The filmmaking is all <laughs> over it. The sound of the camera, the moving, the, it's so, it's cut. It's very, very filmic. And I love his. Yeah. 
and it made the Beckett estate furious. Oh, really? And it almost you know, like really destroyed that. the relationship. There was a huge problem because his was so, it was a new thing. It was a film. Yeah. He made it really, really a film. So, you know, I think Beckett should, you know, and, and his <laughs> family should just let it go, let yeah. it be reinterpreted, let it be really adapted into new forms in the way that they should, you know, that they, that people want to. I think people should, once you make a work, let the world engage with it, reinterpret it, take pieces from it, re-edit re it, you know? How does that um, play into the Yo-Yo Ma collaboration? Because that's also him interpreting Bach, and then you interpreting the performance, and that it seems, but it also seems like you, that was really radical, like, or at least you had a lot of freedom there. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's one of my favorite things, actually, that Yo-Yo Ma piece. Um, because I, it's a, it's so, it is, it is very, it's actually my little slight OCD part got to expose itself in that because I read about Bach when he wrote the um, the cello suites, and he lived in this one town for six years, and there are six suites, and each suite has six movements, and a, everything was sixes, and I thought, <laughs> fantastic, so I will have, how am I going to tie all these elements together? I'll have six gestures, so I call, it's called six gestures, and each gesture somehow uh, reflects the emotion of the movement within my sixth suite. Um, and then I had six forms of storytelling within each movement. So one form of the storytelling or is the cello playing itself of, of Yo-Yo Ma on the t in Times Square or, um, or wherever, or on rooftops. And the other one is the dance yeah. and the, the ice dance. And then the other one is um, just a, a, a narrative, like Bach speaking to camera about his life in Curtin. And anyway, so it was a very, it was kind of, it was thrilling to me. I love that kind of collage -y. but But you have to find an ordering notion for yourself, otherwise it just goes wacky. Yeah. And it looks probably from the, for the outside, like something that I just kind of put together yeah. in editing. Because no. I had, it was my most carefully, I knew it would look like a pizza with too many toppings if I didn't have a real plan, you know? So it was a really carefully planned sort of explosion of types of storytelling and fact-telling. Really, I, I loved that thing. Hmm. What about the, the inclusion of Torvo and Dean, which is super Canadian to be asking this, but it's like one interesting thing about figure skating is the relationship between music and... and and the skating, and how, how did that play into your decision there? Isn't that skating ridiculous yeah. and that genius? Yeah. Was that not like hallucinogenic? I know. How stupid th that was? <laughs> and they wouldn't even like show the lead actor getting their award, but they'd show, anyway, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> hilarious, bad choice. Um, we all make bad choices sometimes. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, Torval and Dean, yeah, I was nervous about that because I don't really, Skating, the aesthetic is not really my aesthetic generally. No, the, no. the clothing and then the so I, <laughs> but I thought, well, this with this music, and if I can control their clothing, and then I thought, okay, I've got to make it austere like Bach. Okay, I'm going to do the whole thing in black and yeah. white, and I'm not going to have any color. It's going to be the most austere thing you've ever seen in your life, and it's just going to be like Bach, you know, yeah. very rigorous and, 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 and all the beauty is bursting out from this very, very strict form. Um, and I, um, I relinquished, I, I sort of backed away from that and sort of made each, uh, each sweet, or each um, movement um, have like a dominant tone and, and made it very monochromatic within it. But, um, no, I was nervous, but then I thought, I'm just being arrogant. I'm being arrogant the way the people uh, in, in 1720 were arrogant about the cello. The cello was not a, 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 a star instrument. It was a backup. It was, a, it was just a, like a support for the star instruments. And Bach, with the cello suites, made it a star. He just unaccompanied cello, just made it the star. And I thought, maybe that's what I can do with skating. 
and make it, um, and I came to love shooting it because ice dancers can do what dancers would love to do, is just hold the line and go for, you know, across the street with one gesture, mm -hmm. you know, and then instead of having to run across the street and boom, 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 boom you know, there's, that you can, it's almost like you, they can do slow motion for you. Yeah. So, and then to add slow motion on top of it. Um, but, uh, so I came, I decided that I had the, a, a very um, elitist uh, attitude towards ice dancing and I, and I had to treat it like the beautiful art form it can be. And, and it, there's one sequence in the Almond that is one of my favorite bits of film that I've ever filmed. And it's out of focus. Um, it's mostly out of focus. It's just the, the dancer, um, uh, you know, um, on his own. And he's uh, dark blue against light. And it's so out of focus that the, the, the figure is elongated. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Love it. I used to say, you know, if you've got a compelling story, a compelling situation, the whole thing can be out of focus. And it's, and you no, know, as long as it's in focus, it's still okay. And now I've even thrown focus yeah, out the yeah. window. I don't even care about that.